we move on to lighting kuthuvelakku lights symbolizes knowledge the darkness symbolizes the ignorance hence the knowledge removes the ignorance the traditional oil lamp has a further spiritual significance the oil in the lamp symbolizes our negative tendency and wick the ego when lit by spiritual knowledge the negative tendencies get slowly exhausted and the ego too finally perishes the flame of the lamp always burns upwards similarly we should acquire knowledge so as to take us towards the higher ideals when dr galbes pronium lost his mother in a young age the woman the aunt mother in law gave him a new meaning in life life can only be understood backwards but it's not be it must be lived forwards she has been a supportive listener whom dr ganbis bronium reverenced as a god sent gift let me first welcome mrs padma murugesan to light the first wick of panchamuga kutthavilak followed by mrs ganbis bronium in marriage each others is a better half for most of the history anonymous is a woman for a successful man there is always a woman here is the lady whose simplicity is a keynote of her elegance i ask mrs kalichelvi to join lighting the kutthavilakku our esteemed speakers dr v r patabiraman and prasanna kumar thomas to join them lighting the kutthavilakku i also invite mr chandrasekhar who is a close aide of dr ganbe subramaniam to join them lighting the kutthavilakku i request dr ganbe subramaniam to offer them bouquet and escort them to get seated distinguished speakers invited guests well wishers beautiful girls and handsome boys ladies and gentlemen i stand before you in welcoming you all for the palmorak event in which we are about to have a wonderful oral treat today i am vel arvind on behalf of dr gs and family gitanchal uh, 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 galaxy medical center and its staff again i extend my warmest welcome to one and all thanks for being here for the sunday i'll be the mc for today's event i would appreciate if you would kindly switch your mobile phone to silent mode thanks for your cooperation we are drowning in the information but starving for knowledge palmorak conceptualized on the following facts to explore the new possibilities to regard old problems from a new angle generates a creative imagination and brings an acquaintance of a real advance in science to our colleagues every artist was first an amateur so was our dr kanbe subramaniam the palmorak event was last time conducted in trichy and since then his pro- professionally has grown much this time dr ganbe subramaniam has chosen topic with due concern he has brought in two speakers and two experts both are reigning heroes in their respective places experts is a someone who changes the confusion to simplicity because confused mind is a commotion ground an expert is someone who has succeeded in making decision and judgment simpler through knowing what to pay attention to and what not to they know that the art of being wise is art of knowing what to overlook that is the real expertise in the non pulmonologist mind there are many possibilities but in the pulmonology experts mind there are few however experts they are there is a caveat when the fate arrives even physician becomes a fool symptoms are the body's mother tongue and signs are the foreign language expert know the foreign language this is not always in a physician power to cure the sick at times disease is stronger than the trained art here we have a physician who have ex- real experience in their field in one decade and two decade respectively both speakers i invite the first speaker dr patabiraman sir to give his talk patabiraman sir he said that you can read i think he is presently working in coimbatore kmch it's a international pulmonologist a lot thing to his credit ch40 years in a kmch coimbatore 
is the one is avant garde of uh, being a, doing a first endobronchus ultrasound 2008 he was the one first of its kind in india to bring it first in coimbatore workshop he has conducted courses in uh, tip that is trends in interventional pulmonology in three course such courses To answer all our imaginative queries, let me welcome our first expert. As I glean information from Dr. G.S., perfection is not attainable. If we chase the perfection, we can exact the excellence. Dr. Patabi Raman has been consistently successful physician because of his novelty and innovative approach. He was best known for his excellent fine arts activities which when he was in medical school. Sir, we feel honored today by your presence and the sharing day with us. With advance in technology, even truth often stranger than f science fiction. Now we have Patabi Raman sir, you will say that tomorrow starts now. Uh, thank you Dr. Vail and uh, for those nice words. Can we just switch it? And first of all, let me thank uh, uh, my good friend Ganapati for having uh, invited me uh, twice this year, I mean uh, twice this Palmo, uh, Palmo Rock. So this is the second time I'm really ha uh, happy to be here again. And the topic uh, is, uh, is going to be higher end interventions in procedural pulmonology or interventional pulmonology as we say. And uh, uh, we are a group of three. I just represent uh, the work of all three of us. It's not my own only. There, there are three of us here. And this is the institute we, where I work. It's a 750 bedded hospital, Kohei Medical Center Hospital with a 200 bed cancer center at the moment. And uh, uh, by definition, who is an interventional pulmonologist or an interventional anything related to medical specialty is someone who intervenes uh, between the surgeon and his pocket. So that is what uh, interventional is uh, supposed to be, meaning most of the uh, procedures that we do were formally done by the uh, surgeons and we try to do what we can using uh, certain uh, tubes uh, and uh, you know, certain uh, procedures. And I'll uh, briefly, uh, grossly classify them uh, as a diagnostic interventions and a therapeutic intervention. And in the diagnostic intervention, I'll spend some time on the endobronchial ultrasound, which is very close to my heart. And uh, it, certain innovations that we've done in uh, EBUS TBNA over the past uh, five years that we've had this uh, wonderful tool. And in therapeutic interventions, uh, it, it, the, the very uh, important focus would be on a rigid bronchoscopy because rigid bronchoscopy, which was a last art, is now regaining because of the advent of interventions. And we'd like to just, uh, you know, briefly deal, uh, deal with uh, tumor re removal, managing hemoptysis, foreign body stenting and balloon bronchoplasty. All these are going to be case discussions and uh, for obvious reasons uh, we'll show only successful uh, procedures which means that this procedure is fraught with certain risks and all procedures need not be successful and there can be failures and there can be really a lot of uh, morbidity in, in, the, in the procedures we do. So some part of uh, some kind of training is very important. Let's look at the options for this particular gentleman who had a subcarinal lymphadenopathy, paratracheal lymphadenopathy. So uh, a patient is smoker with a subcarinal lymph node. What are the things that can be done? Um, uh, apart from certain, uh, uh, you know, radiologists who try to poke all the way through into the subcarinal node, which is uh, kind of very, very difficult uh, to do. There are uh, other means. Uh, the most important thing, a very simple one would be a, a called as a... Uh, uh, transbronchial needle aspiration wherein it, in a regular bronchoscope you put in a uh, in a, a transbronchial needle which is a needle with a sheath. Now this is a sheath that is partly seen here. Once the sheath comes out and this is the left main bronchus, that's the right main bronchus and you place this needle in this subcarinal area and push the needle. Now this is a relatively brain procedure. So what you do at the distal end of the needle is an attachment with the suction. So you keep suctioning it and you keep uh, moving it back and forth. So you do essentially a transbronchial needle aspiration which is an FNAC of a node similar to an FNAC of a cervical node. It's just an extension we do an FN FNAC of a uh, mediastinal node. Very simple, it just takes another 15 to 30 minutes of a scope time. It's good for big nodes rather, uh, because it's a blind uh, thing. The, the caveats are the nodes are small, you can't approach the smaller nodes and its yield ranges between 30 and 70 percent depending on the paper you read. It's extremely operator dependent, it needs kind of training but it needs a meticulous attention to steps, attention to the steps to prevent injury to the uh, 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 scope and injury to the blood vessels also. But then 
poking a blood vessel is not an issue which i'll tell you uh, subsequently but these are the vessels that are seen all around there is a pulmonary artery which takes a course like this this is a descending artery and an ascending artery which which loops around the right left main bronchus there is an svc here and as i go joins the svc roughly at around 3 o'clock uh, uh, at the distal end of the trachea so these are the vessels that we'll need to uh, see because the nodes are parked exactly between them there is a 4r node which is a right paratracheal node which is between the uh, ascending artery and the svc there is a 4 L node which is a left paratracheal node which is between aorta and pulmonary artery it is also called as aorta pulmonary node and right atrium sits behind this subcarinal region so we we'll need to be quite meticulous and as we go further to sample the hilar nodes we have all these branches of pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins to contend with and if you go up to uh, sample the uh, uh, 2r which is the uh, upper paratracheal and uh, upper uh, left and the right we have the extensions and the branches of all the vessels like uh, you know uh, you know innominate artery and so on and brachiocephalic veins which have to be contended with so to prevent injury to these vessels and do all these fnacs under vision we have what is called as a endobronchial ultrasound wherein there is a, a slight modification of an existing bronchoscope there is a balloon attachment here because air we know is a very poor conductor of ultrasound so around the uh, distal transducer you have a balloon channel which uh, fills with saline so that you can have a, 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 a you know a appropriate vision it's a convex probe a linear probe and you get a parallel uh, uh, you know imaging and you also have the bronchoscope with an endo image here this is where you see the inside the airway and this is a transducer which helps seeing outside the airway and after you fix these images you pass the sheath and this needle in and so everything is done under vision and we have a very great control over what happens and this is a special needle this needle is tipped with the distal tip is echo uh, tipped so you can see the needle as it courses through the uh, lymph node and this is a special adapter which is slightly different from a regular bronchoscope there is another adapter here and there will be a balloon channel the needle sits in here gets locked and the whole sheath can go out and then the needle comes out so it is done during the uh, i mean uh, by a special way and we this is our bronch suite and we will need to obviously uh, prepare the patient usually done in a conscious sedation it's an office procedure patient walks in and walks out of the uh, scope room it can also be used with an lma or endotracheal tube uh, or in europe through a rigid Well, but we prefer a conscious sedation because it basically remains an office procedure. With the help of your pathologist, even you can get a report in the same day. This is a balloon tip that we are looking at. Uh, it's usually a oral procedure. We usually follow a nasal procedure for a regular bronchoscope, but this scope is slightly bulkier than the regular scope, so we usually uh, put the scope through the uh, mouth. And this is the left paratracheal node. The ebuscope is in, and then you face towards the left, and you have the pulmonary artery and aorta and the node is parked in between and the green dot here will tell the place from where the needle comes in so you can have an idea as to where the needle comes out and this is a left paratracheal uh, which can go either here or here and you can see the node here and with a bit of an azagos here and this is a subcarinal node where you can push the scope either into the right main bronchus or into the left main bronchus and turn it inwards medially and you can have a, a range and you can see the node here and the right atrium here and uh, the uh, needle is here and the needle is 4 cm needle with a 2 cm block so you can push the needle to 2 cm you can even mark this and find out where the needle is going so that you can uh, identify the needle depth so let's just see this is uh, uh, our colleagues and uh, i mean all three of us are here and this is the uh, node and uh, there is an endo image where the uh, uh, endoscopic image is there and this is an ultrasound image in two two places uh, that we have to help the operator not straining the neck and you can see that there is a node here and once the node is here you can see that the uh, sheath comes out and then the, uh, it is locked and then the needle comes out and it goes directly bang in it will go in you know there will be a very fleeting uh, presence and once the needle goes out you will see the image of the needle that comes out through the node and once it happens you uh, you connect it to a negative section uh, like what has been done so you can see that the node is inside and once that happens you uh, you push this uh, uh, you know uh, a needle uh, you do a back and forth movement through this this is a needle which is seen very clearly and you do an fnac now the difference between this and the conventional needle is that the uh, conventional needle uh, you will not be able to see where you are going and uh, there is a uh, you know lengthier needle 
and you can have a doppler so that you can avoid the blood vessels and the needle has a uh, echo tip and there is a irregular portion inside and so you you, ha- you tend to get higher number of cores which can help in immunohistochemistry and few other things you can even run a flow you can run uh, uh, at least five panels of ihc and we also uh, done uh, egfr mutation so there are in- list is endless as far as what we can do so basically this is what you do you put the scope in install it saline identify image it and then push the needle in and that's where uh, you get the uh, thing so these are the existing indications for endobronchial ultrasound to stage lung cancer is what it was uh, uh, it arrived but the diagnosis of mediastinal lymphadenopathy is the reason why we usually do it there is also a restaging in lung cancer and sampling the nodes around the airways uh, the lesion can be around the airways and so let's look at one of the case so this is a patient who had a mass in the right six segment or uh, uh, right superior basal segment and uh, see this is the this is the place where there is a mass it is around the airway but it's in the lung it's not in the mediastinum but we put the bronchoscope in you could see there is only extrinsic compression of the right interlobar uh, i mean uh, there is a right uh, bronchus intermedius there is a depression here so this is the place where i have a mass so what we did was we just put in an endobronchial ultrasound and you can see the whole mass here and whole mass with the uh, you can uh, you know uh, uh, take a sample like what we showed and it can uh, show in this case it was a squamous cell carcinoma now uh, we just look at certain innovations that we done with an existing uh, 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 endobronchial ultrasound so this is a patient who came intubated now this was a middle aged smoker was referred from a nearby host- ortho hospital patient had a vertebral lesion now after the vertebral lesion for evaluation of back pain they did a vertebral surgery and the biopsy was inconclusive but the patient continued to develop a respiratory distress he was intubated he was in a high peep and a fio2 So the CT showed nodules in the lung and a huge subcranial node. The patient could not tolerate bronchoscopy. He was already in a high PEEP and a FAO of 80%. The moment you put the bronchoscope in, the patient desaturates. And the, since the, the PEEP is gone, the patient had to be, uh, it was struggling. So here we have a patient who has no diagnosis because the procedure in the vertebra was also non-specific. Patient continues to worsen, requires high FAO on PEEP and he could not tolerate the scope inside the ET. So what we did was we shifted the patient to the bronchoscope suite on a ventilator. after the complete monitoring the ebus was inserted into the esophagus now you can see that there is a endotracheal tube here and uh, we can push the scope uh, uh, through this especially with an endotracheal uh, tube the patient was intubated he was can easily go into the esophagus all you need just lift it and then uh, push it in it just goes in and once you go in the subcranial node and the left paratracheal nodes are pretty easy to uh, I think this video is not working, but this is basically how the esophageal looks uh, node looks from the esophagus, and from there you just push in. So uh, we could make a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. The patient didn't survive, but he had a diagnosis before he died. So the patient, uh, you know, attenders were at least, uh, uh, you know, uh, convinced that uh, there there is a reason for worsening, and uh, you know, so that is a uh, point. Again. the multiple lung lesions in this particular case so now the way we look at the ct imaging is quite different now once we have a, a ebus and also the fact that we can put in the esophagus now this is a mass which is close to esophagus has no relation to the airway it's difficult to uh, go through this because there is a rib on the top a, a rib so ct get it was also difficult so here you can see that there is a clear association between the esophagus it just sits on the esophagus and you image it and we could easily push this uh, you know uh, node and then uh, i mean a mass and then get it and we can also sample paraesophageal node so this is the aorta and this is the esophagus and this is the paraesophageal node this was done in 2009 we could easily uh, i mean there's an elderly lady we could see three nodes actually one two and three nodes and this is the descending aorta we went through the esophagus again and got a diagnosis of tuberculosis so we could with an endobronchial ultrasound uh, sample most of what happens around the airways and also around the esophagus now this is a kind of uh, free case in a 49 year old male uh, resident of kerala evaluated for left chest pain and progressive anorexia found to have less left uh, lung mass now this is a ct and a very uh, i mean in per- in kerala they did once a ct gar biopsy pretty logically because it's just uh, sitting on the airway wall push the no- uh, uh, lesion there was non uh, non specific necrosis was what they got they did it again again a necrosis a bit of hemoptysis and a bit of uh, uh, pneumothorax now the patient had two procedures and at the end of it there was non specific necrotic change so out of desperation since there is a small left paratracheal node the uh, pulmonologist there uh, uh, just referred it to us now this is a uh, paratracheal node and this is aorta and pulmonary artery and we just spoke this node and to our dismay this node was also 
um, non-specific or necrotic. That is CT guided biopsy twice, yielding necrosis and blood and the second attempt a bit of pneumothorax and the patient didn't want another CT guided biopsy. We did an EBUS TP in the nose and we try also to push the needle between the artery and pulmonary artery in the place which we thought was a mass and again that revealed a necrosis only. Terrible frustration for the patient and then uh, we saw that the only area that was thick was beyond the iota. Now this is the iota, we did the uh, Doppler and the here after five procedures we went ahead and uh, after explaining the informed consent and all that, we thought we could go across the iota taking needle through and through into the mass because that is the only portion that was thick. Now we did a pet in between, I don't have the images but the pet showed a thin rim of met, uh, activity but uh, the rest of it is, was negative. So what we had to do was to you know uh, kind of impale this lesion. So what we did was after explaining everything and looking at the literature, there are literature to support this. This is the thickest portion. This is the iota. The only dif uh, difference is this needle has a 4 centimeter needle and this iota was around 2.8 2 centimeter. And so what we did was we pushed the needle through and through on both sides of the iota. So this needle goes and there is also a stillet which will block the uh, core. So we just push this from the, uh, uh, this portion of the uh, iota across to this portion of the iota, it pierces through the iota and then it reaches the node and from there we did an EBUS uh, TBNA. Now we had to do this because one, there was no diagnosis and it was obviously a malignancy, but we had to identify that. We looked at the literature, there have been 14 cases of uh, transvascular tra uh, TBNA showing uh, that there is uh, no complications so far because the needle is small and the iota has a very thick uh, muscular layer. So, and this is the only place which was thick and so that is the reason why we had to do this and ultimately we, go we got a diagnosis of adenocarcinoma and we repeated uh, CT to ma quickly make sure that there is no other uh, thing and uh, you know uh, this was a transvascular thing after this we've done once more uh, only when we are pushed to one was uh, through the pulmonary artery so that is about the endobronchial ultrasound and it's uh, you know uh, thing we've done a few uh, bronchogenic cysts also but due to time I'm not really um, going into all that let's move over to the therapeutic uh, stuff which is um, uh, f uh, the cornerstone of which was the rigid bronchoscopy. This was first identified, I mean, uh, a, uh, was performed first to remove a pork bone in 1897 by Gustav Killian, a German uh, uh, physician, removed a bone stuck in the right main bronchus. He's considered the frog of bronchology. Rigid was almost exclusively used by the surgeon. It was replaced by the FOB when uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy when Nikita found the wonderful tool. But look at these two scenarios. There's a 21 year old 